simple, isn't it? What was once considered an extraordinary feat only a few years ago. Man's probing of the frontiers of the environment around us, we now almost take for granted. Frontiers which are not so very far away, and which nevertheless impose serious limitations on human capabilities. Man's ability to acclimatize is surprisingly limited. At some 10,000 feet above sea level, the human body is already beginning to behave differently in the thinner air. Nobody would think of trying to fly at three times that height unless they were within the safety of a pressurized aircraft. And a similar environmental boundary exists beneath the surface of the sea. While divers may acclimatize easily in the shallow depths of a watery environment, there exist deeper frontiers which demand a greater understanding of the way our bodies function in these alien situations. And for the offshore oil and gas exploration and production industry, that understanding is essential. General at 1300. High 40s, 1,027, expected Humber, 1,029, by 1,300 tomorrow. The familiar bulletins which cover our offshore installations. It's pressure, or the changes in pressure, which creates the weather systems. It's pressure, or lack of it, which requires the provision of specially constructed hulls for high-flying aircraft. It's pressure, or excess of it, which changes the way in which our bodies use the air we breathe when underwater. The deeper we go, the greater the change. In the early days of offshore exploration, most gas and oil reserves were found beneath shallow water, and it was rare for divers to encounter depths of more than 50 meters. As the industry moved into deeper waters, it became essential for diving activity to be undertaken at up to nearly five times those depths but with a need for future work at up to 10 times as deep at 500 meters. The way in which underwater pressure increases is dramatic. At sea level, one atmosphere, the pressure exerted on our bodies is the result of the weight of the atmosphere above extending upwards for about 100 kilometers. A diver needs to descend only 10 meters into the sea for the combined weight of atmosphere and water to equal twice the normal pressure found at the surface. A further 10 meters and another atmosphere and so on. So that at 150 meters, the water depth around many North Sea installations, a diver will be subjected to 16 times the normal atmospheric pressure. The main problem facing the diver as he descends is that as pressure increases, more and more of the air he breathes dissolves into his bloodstream and body tissues. The greater the depth and the longer the time spent underwater, the greater the amount of gases that will dissolve. The problem is further complicated by the fact that air is mostly a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. Beyond 30 meters, nitrogen becomes toxic to man. And for this reason, the use of air as a breathing gas for diving is limited to 50 meters. The high partial pressure of nitrogen results in a form of narcosis which intoxicates the diver, impairing judgment and efficiency. Nitrogen narcosis is a serious hazard. High partial pressure of oxygen also causes problems of toxicity, and this could lead to tissue damage in the body. At depths of more than 50 meters, a helium and oxygen breathing gas, heliox, is used to overcome the toxic effects. At 100 meters depth, the mixture may in fact contain only 5% oxygen. As depth increases, so the amount of oxygen has to be decreased still further, until at 400 meters, the proportion is just less than 1%. 
complicated and costly equipment is required to monitor and control oxygen within prescribed tolerance levels. We have, in effect, reached a temporary technical frontier, which still has to be crossed. When the diver returns to the surface, the pressure drops, and gases which have been dissolved into the body have to come out of solution. Careful routines are adopted to ensure that the harmful, possibly even fatal effects of too rapid a decompression, decompression sickness, or the bends, does not occur. The time taken to go through the decompression process will depend on the depth and the amount of time that a diver has spent underwater. An hour's work underwater at 50 meters will need nearly two and a half hours decompression. At 150 meters, the total decompression time for the same work period is around 29 hours. If the diver spends a longer time underwater, then eventually both the body and blood will become totally saturated with breathing gas. It will then take just over three days to go through decompression. And whether the diver stays down for a day, a few days, or even a month, he will still need only three days decompression time before he can return to normal atmospheric pressure conditions. To overcome the problem of such lengthy decompression times, the technique of saturation diving was developed. Divers live under pressure in a hyperbaric complex and transfer to and from the underwater work sites in a bell which is also under the same pressure. This unit, a pressurized equivalent of the car or bus we would use to go to and from our jobs, is raised at the end of a work session and divers transferred into their living quarters until required for the next spell of duty. Here they are fed and watered under pressure. They rest and sleep under pressure. The complex may be large enough to accommodate several shifts of divers. Here, everything they do is scrutinized by the monitoring team. There are specialized facilities to cater for emergencies. Evacuation from an installation or diving support vessel can be undertaken by means of a hyperbaric lifeboat or by using a helicopter transportable miniature chamber. Okay, that's the chamber mated, pressurizing the hook now. Okay, Kevin. And it's to the National Hyperbaric Center in Aberdeen that these emergency support systems can be brought for tying in to a unique facility. But this emergency service is only one small part of its operation. Here, research and development work is undertaken on behalf of industries with specific interests in hyperbaric technology and expertise. Whether it's simulating subsea conditions at 1,000 meters or high altitude environments on the threshold of space. As exploration probes these environmental frontiers even further, the methods and equipment by which man undertakes work in these hostile conditions have to be proven. Here are facilities for product performance evaluation, work efficiency and operational safety studies, as well as unique facilities for surgery and medical treatment in hyperbaric conditions. In the space of a very few years, we have learned much about the problems of enabling man to venture into seemingly impossible surroundings. The frontiers are still there, of course, but they've been gradually pushed back. And the National Hyperbaric Center is at the leading edge of the developments that will enable man to continue safely to work under pressure.